our recording. Okay. What's going on, guys? We are back again. Very special episode. Every episode that we do is special. We got Monsignor Jamie from Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church. Uh, Monsignor Jamie is the host of uh, Breaking Bread. Uh, it's a show. It's awesome. They have a lot of guests. I've actually been a guest on it. And, uh, you know, he's a Monsignor at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, which, of course, does a Giglio feast. And uh, what's going on, buddy? Great How to are have you? you. Thanks. Good you to know, have you. I'm very happy to be here today. Thanks, buddy. So first you start off, I'm the host of Breaking Bread. So host want... of Breaking Bread. Right. And where do we find that show? It's on YouTube? It's or... on the net station, but you can Google Breaking Bread on YouTube. Uh, my name, Monsignor Jamie, and it'll come up. And you, I, I've seen it. You've had Lydia, and you've had all kinds of I've amazing people. I've been to people. Rayos, I've been to Frescos, all over the city. Yep. David Burke has been on my show, so it's great. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. All you guys, all you pizza heads out there, when you're in Brooklyn, you got to go visit Monsignor. Jamie, so Monsignor, tell me uh, where, where, how'd this all start for you? How'd you how'd you become uh, the most popular priest in Brooklyn? Well, I don't know if I'm the most popular, <laughs> but I'm up there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, yeah. When I was a kid, I loved to cook. My mother and we were an Italian family. My mother and father both cooked, and uh, at 11 years old, I was baking cakes and uh, you know cooking. So I enjoyed it. During high school, I went to work for a caterer to okay. make a couple extra dollars. And uh, so happens that the caterer's brother was an instructor at the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Every everyone's heard it, right? Yeah. The CIA. CIA. Right. So uh, what happened was when I graduated college, uh, high school, I went to the culinary. And uh, I went there for two years. And uh, I worked at the uh, Carlisle, the Intercontinental, uh, Marriott's Essex House, if you know, I'm showing my age years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so I did that, and that's how I, you know, that's my food background. And uh, I did that until I was like, um, you know, 20, 29 years old. And at 30, I entered the seminary. Uh, at 30 years old. 30 so, years old. So the seminary, that's like uh, that's what a, you the, go that's to. That's the preschool. That's the preschool. The yeah. preschool. Right. You go to school for, to become a priest. So what, like, uh, what uh, motivated you or what inspired you to uh you know, take the cloth. Is yes. that the right way? Uh, uh, take the leap of faith, I call it. Leap of faith. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's something that, you know, you don't wake up one day and say, I want to be a priest. It's mm -hmm. something that's inside of you. It was inside of me since I was a kid. Uh, when I was a, a young boy in school, I went to parochial school and I was an altar server. And uh, I was always around the church. I, I, you know, I did all those things that, you know, nice young boys do. And right. I... I, I I would help the nuns out and, uh, you know, move their furniture around, throw out the garbage for them and, you know, carry their books to the convent. And, you know, when the priest was having a, a party or something, I would, you know, help them fix everything up. And we were having an altar boy outing, uh, go to Great Adventure or something like that. I would organize everything. So I was always involved. And when I went to high school, I became a lector in the church. I was involved in, in teen, you know, teen groups and things like that, prayer groups. So it was something that, you know, was always inside of me that I kind of pushed to the side. You know, I put the call on, call waiting. 100%. <laughs> so, so what kind of like, um, I, I think like not enough people know, to, like what kind of work do you guys do? Like what, what is like some of the things that you're most proud of, you know what I mean? As a priest? Yeah. Well, I mean, as a career. priest, uh, you're, you're there with people during some very beautiful and happy occasions. But you're also there during some sad occasions. Right. Uh, and what a priest had, the uniqueness about a priest is he's able to be there with people at a level that most people can't be at with people. You can be like at that level with family members or friends, but to be at that level with so many people and to have an effect on so many lives, young and old, rich and poor, uh, it's very, um, you know, uh, fulfilling. Um, you're there, as I said, at, at baptisms and births. You're there at communions and confirmations, weddings and things like that, anniversaries. But then you're also there at, at you're at the hospital when people are sick. You do right. funerals and, you know, you're there to support people, encourage people, and most importantly, to give people hope that no matter what happens in life, there's always hope. And uh, that's what a priest does. And it's very fulfilling. 
I, you know, I mean, it makes perfect sense now that you're saying that. I never even thought about it like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that makes a ton of sense. I mean, that that does sound super fulfilling. Um, what kind of uh, you do? So tell me about like breaking bread. How did that all start for you? Well, what happened about I was a priest. Uh, I would say about five, six years, uh, and then the um, the bishop asked me to kind of. Uh, be in charge of fundraising for the diocese. Mm -hmm. So I'm in charge of all the fundraising in the whole diocese. I, I raise funds for our uh, programs and our parishes. I raise funds for our CYO program. And most importantly, I raise funds for our Catholic schools. And we give out scholarships to underprivileged children who would not be able to attend our schools uh, because of financial reasons. And the money I raise uh, over $8 million a year, and it's not enough, but you know, it, it does put a dent in, in, in you know, in the um, in the lives of children to, to attend our school. So they pay part of their tuition, but they don't have to pay the whole thing. So they're able to attend. But um, when I was doing that, um, also our diocesan cable station was going through a revision. So they asked, they wanted to have more human life stories, human interest stories. Right. So they asked me if I would do this. And I said, of course, uh, you know, I have a great personality, I think, I'm outgoing. <laughs> and uh, and it's funny because I, I, when I went to the culinary, I learned cooking, you learn the basics. But when I went into the, uh, when I worked in the field, uh, I did mostly front of the house, you know, restaurant manager, right. catering, maitre d', I worked, you know, I because I'm a people person. So um, they asked me to do the show and I really just, you know, picked up my old uh, cookbooks and I just started doing things. And part of the show was not only cooking, but also visiting different restaurants right? and vis famous chefs and stuff like that. So that's how I got involved in it. And uh, many people watch the show. I mean, it's funny, you walk around and they, oh, aren't you the cooking priest? And I said, yeah, that's me. I know when <laughs> I was on the show, I was getting stopped. Oh, I saw you on Breaking Bread uh, the other day when uh, I'm walking around the uh, neighborhood and everything. Uh, so uh, very important week coming up. Uh, the Feast of St. Polino, the Giglio Feast, the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Feast. It goes by a lot of names. Right. Um, you want to you want to go in or you want to talk about sure, it? Sure, sure, of course. What uh, it is? Well, the, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, first of all, the feast is a, you know, is a festival in a parish. And usually it um, highlights uh, a saint. So in our parish of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, every church has a patron saint that they're named after. Mm -hmm. So in honor of. And um, our church is Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And it has always been a tradition in our parish for over 135 years is that on her feast day, uh, we would take her statue, the statue of Our Lady of Mount Carmel out of the church, and we would walk around the streets. It's a tradition that many you know, uh, countries have uh, where you, you, you parade in public, you bring the church to the people, right. and you have a public display of our faith. So that church, our parish, has been doing that for 135 years. Now, it's, it's combined with the feast of St. Paulinus. St. Paulinus was a, a bishop in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. And what he did was, uh, he was in a town called Nola in southern Italy. And during that time, uh, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, invasions taking place at the time and there were a group of invaders that came and they captured, they captured some of the women and children of the town and they brought them to southern Africa and they were held ransom and they were you know uh, uh, baiting them and bribing them to you know pay them money and if not they were going to kill them and all so the bishop he went and he went to southern Africa to get them released and he offered his own self, his own life, that they would be rescued. He went there, and not only were they rescued, but he returned. Right. Uh, and he returned. Um, there was a, 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 a Turk that found out about what he was doing and helped him to escape from Africa with, uh, you know, the women and children who were held captive. Right. And when he returned to the town of southern Italy, uh, to southern Italy, he was greeted by the townspeople with lilies. And um, so they greeted him. After he died and became a saint for what he did, um, the, the the people in the neighborhood, the parishes and in, in the Italian tradition, uh, they started to display his statue on his feast day. And then what happened was the parishes then became very competitive. 
So they started to build the statue higher and higher and higher so that their statue was the highest one. Right, because in NOLA, there's like 10 of them right, going on. Each parish cr uh, creates and constructs their own Julia. Oh, I didn't even know. I yes. didn't know that. That was 10. That there's, makes perfect sense. Well, actually, there's seven parishes in NOLA. Okay. And each parish creates. And not only do they make them higher, then they got in, into the tradition of decorating them, giving them a theme. Right. So they all, on his feast day, they all march around. They dance the statue through the very narrow streets into the town square. And then all the seven uh, uh, Gilios are lined up, and they it's like a competition, and they did, and, and they vote on which was the best one. Right, and they go like, right. I mean, they, I think they have like, somebody told me they have some kind of point system if you yeah. hit the buildings the least amount right. of times. And when the they're music walking through you're the very downtown, down the streets, if they hit the buildings, how long they hold held, they hold it up for without dropping it and resting, uh, right. the music, the theme. The, so all these things go into play. And then what happened was, um, so this went on for, you know, centuries, uh, you know, in, in different ways. At the turn of the century here, when people settled in different neighborhoods in the United States and, and especially in Brooklyn, right. uh, they brought these traditions back with them. Yes. So when I was growing up in Long Island City at St. Rita's Parish, we had a Giglio too. Really? Uh, because there were people from there. The Feast of Our Lady Mount Carmel in Brooklyn and St. Paulinus was combined at this parish because you had the people from NOLA and you had the Feast of Our Lady Mount Carmel. Sure. So they combined the two feast, day, two feast days and they made one long feast. The feast day of uh, St. Paulinus is June 22nd. Correct. Yes. And at the time, they had the feast from June 22nd to the feast day of Our Lady Mount Carmel, July 16th. Really? So that it, long? It was a long time. You're talking about 16. And, and this is in Williamsburg? You said this is in. No, long... no, in, in Williamsburg, here yeah, yeah, at yeah, our yeah, parish. Yeah. Okay. Now, many other parishes had a feast, and many of them had just the Giglio, but many of them have died down. But it would be like a one day or three one day, day three day, yeah, but yeah, nothing yeah. like the feast here in Brooklyn. Well, I remember they used to have it in Franklin Park, right? Or, exactly. And then we did it in the Bronx for in a the couple ha in years. In Harlem, in Harlem, they're still doing it, right? But they do it one day. It's it's a yeah. you know half a block long. Right. I mean, Brooklyn is the place. Yeah. Okay? No. Our Lady of Mount Carmel is the place to be for this feast. Yeah. When I uh, when I first you know like I I never seen the. Uh, feast growing up, you know, because right. I didn't grow up in Williamsburg, right. and you know, I didn't even really understand like like how many Italians were right. in Williamsburg until we opened the pizzeria, and I yeah. well uh, until later on. Yeah. But um, you know, the first time I ever saw it, I was mem uh, mesmerized. For those guys who don't know, and Brady, if you could look it up, I'm, yeah, the Jolio yeah. feast. You want to pull some stuff up? Yeah, look at yeah. That. So that's it. As you can um, see. It's, you know... Yeah, scroll down a little bit. Yeah. It's four yeah. stories high. Yeah. Look at the buildings. Yeah. It's over the buildings. Yeah. And... It's 80 feet high. It's... it's and that's the uh, the float with Our Lady of Mount Carmel. That you bring it. around. But this is the Giglio. As you can see, it's 80 feet high. And the whole, a band... You know, this is the boat. Now, what makes our feast unique, too, is that we have a boat as well. Right, right, right. Where people carry the, the Turk, boat. The Turk. And that, that symbolizes... Um, the Turk with the bishop coming back, coming from back. and they meet together. So that's the look high how point. how old these are. Oh, these, uh, now, look, this has to be in the 40s. I mean, if you look yeah. at the buildings, uh, it's amazing. Uh, this is across the street from the church now. Where they have an 11-story building going up. There's actually right. something I looked up um, years ago because I, I'm, I'm like a nutcase and I went down like a rabbit hole like, and I needed to know every single little thing about all this. And uh, there was like a, a, a site that uh, some doctor had created because these guys, the lifters, and they're, they're super dedicated guys and shout out to all the lifters and everybody involved in this because so much respect, but they actually get physical deformities oh, well, from lifting. Because, yes, because the poles that, that stick out, okay, that they carry, there's about 120 uh, paranza, the, the lifters. Right. And they're the ones that lift the Giglio and the boat and in each corner, you have a lieutenant, and the lieutenant is in charge of his crew. Mm. And his crew is, uh, is, he has about 35 to 40 people in his crew. So they have to coordinate the turns and the lifting, so he makes sure that all his guys are in place. But if you go back to the picture, I said in the 50s, if you look at those cars, 
Uh, I'm look. This is very current, but if you look at some of the cars, yeah, I don't yeah. think you could stop the slideshow on the website. Right? Yeah, no, but you it's could. just uh, it, it's just amazing uh, when you think about it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's completely out of yeah. control. I, and you see, the band sits uh, stands on, it sits on it as well. Yeah, and it weighs two tons when you you know the structure. Plus, you itself. got another yeah. what 10, 15 guys on there that right. weigh. To, you know, buck seventy five each. Exactly, uh, and, then the, and then the pastor's on there too. He's above yeah. there. So uh, that's I, you. I, that's me. That's what's in jail. One hundred pounds. So <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so as you can see, it is uh, a unique thing, and thousands of people come. Yeah, uh, we lift it on two Sundays. Uh, we lift it on the, the first Sunday that we call Giulio Sunday, and then we lift it the second Sunday that we call Old Timers Day. Yeah, uh, but look at those cars there. Those look like the the 30s. Yeah, right. Those they definitely are, they definitely know, look like the yeah the amazing. 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s. Yeah. yeah, it's insane how long this has been going on, and these guys brought it over. Um, I mean, I think personally, like, I mean, nothing against any other feast or anything, but like, you know what I mean. Like, there's uh, especially everybody in the world knows um, about this feast. Well, no, the uh, what's the the one in Little Italy, uh, oh, San, Gennaro. San Gennaro. So everyone in the world knows San Gennaro, and I feel like just as many people should know about this. I yeah. think this is like definitely the most special feast in America. Yeah. It's certainly the oldest, yeah. and. Um, yeah, ma'am. I mean, we, we, we got to so many people show up. Don't get me wrong. But like, I, I think I should be able to call like anybody in California. And they're like, oh, yeah, the Giulio feast. Yeah. Of course. You know, I, you know, you could say you use an analogy. There's pizza. You know, there's Pizza Hut. Yeah. Right. There's Domino's. And then there's Williamsburg pizza. Okay. Yeah, I like that. You have you have bazaars and you have feast. Then you have our Lady of Mount Carmel feast at yeah. St. Paulinus. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. No, it's a it's a truly amazing thing. So um yeah, and then uh also, I mean, I think we should talk about like real quick, one of my favorite things about the feasts is the Questa. Right. Um so but, yeah, if you want to the Questa explain. is uh uh something that was started to raise money to have a feast because you know you put on a feast it costs money you have of to course. get lighting you have to get permits especially today then they didn't have permits in those days but you had to build the giglio and the yeah. structure the band you have to pay for all these things so they started to go out begging on the day before with bread and they would give out bread and people would make a donation right and um that money they used to um pay for the expenses of the feast over the years, it became a tradition where people would wait for them to come, and they would put out food in front of their houses, drinks and things like that. Really? And they would stop. The band would come and play. And it's also getting people excited for Giulio Sunday and letting them know that the feast is going on. You know, it was a way of advertising. You know, today we have social media. We have, you know, everything like that. In those days, they didn't. So they actually went through the neighborhoods letting people know you know with the band and the bread that we're having a feast right and come and that's how they got the word out yeah i mean for me i brought my son to it like three times it's amazing so there's a there's a greenpoint crew north side crew and a south side right, crew right. and they got a couple of golf carts and they get followed by a big van which has i don't know how many bread do you even know oh yeah Ten we Oh no, we, we we go about you know maybe I would say about three thousand loaves of bread. Three thousand loaves of bread. Right. They all have the cross right uh, On it. scored onto them. And we, I mean, at one time obviously there was just you know one 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 group that went out. But right. As the parish got larger, and you know people had to go through all these different you know uh, you know different neighborhoods in a sense, different uh, neighborhoods around the parish. It was too much for one day. Right. So they started to divide it into different groups. Yeah, no, I can imagine because, uh, I mean, that takes all day, the north right. side. Uh, right. I'm always, I always go with the north side guys and, you know, it's a whole day thing. And there's people that let us into their houses sure. and we go, uh, you know, eat some food and, oh, yeah. and hang out before yeah. we go out. And it's... Um, it's a really special thing. It's uh, you know, you're you're in New York City, so you got tall buildings, so you're you know, uh throwing the bread oh, up yeah, like yeah. five stories, yeah. people get excited and you we know have what I mean? so we have stories where we had 
uh, we have kids, right? We have the ladies on the third or fourth floor, the Italian ladies, they come out, they put a string on a basket, they drop it down, yeah. she puts a donation and they send up the bread. You have kids <laughs> throwing it up to them, some of them catch it and all. And you know, the band makes people know that the, they're coming and it's fun, it's fun. You know, the whole feast is fun, yeah. It's a you know practice of our faith, it's a devotion uh, of expressing our faith. It's a way of getting young people involved in our faith. Right. And uh, but it's excitement in the neighborhood, and and these traditions have to continue. You know, so many traditions are dying today, and we have to keep these traditions alive. And this is one of the the greater traditions uh, in in Brooklyn. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. And I think I think people are missing. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there that are missing something that they can't quite put their finger on. We've been talking a lot with people about, um, you know, you kind of like after my grandmother's generation like and this obviously like this doesn't apply to every single person obviously people are individuals but in general you know what i mean like you know when my grandmother was alive it was every single sunday you got together and oh, it, yeah. was the, it was the whole family and then yes. you know with my father and mother's generation and you know i know a lot of kids that i grew up with in this it's you know they still get together for the birthday parties and this and that but it's not it's not sundays. like every sunday thing anymore and we've been saying like you know it, it's something like as a community a lot of people are missing and we've been trying to you know every other weekend or whenever we can and we got to be more vigilant about it i think but bringing people over cooking homemade right. meals making the pasta doing all these things and sunday sauce sunday sauce <laughs> you know what i mean and it doesn't even have to be a sunday it could be any oh, day sure. but but as long as you're together and cooking and and that's what's missing know. today i mean that's what's missing in society it's that family quality time uh you know that uh, you know one time everything was closed on sunday right sunday was church day no matter what church you went what religion you were in most people went on sunday or you know of course some people go on saturday but that was the, that was the family day after church you, you you ate dinner with as a family and then in the evening you would go and visit your extended family your grandmother right. your cousins and everyone would always gather around that was the tradition and today a lot of that's gone and i think it is having an effect on our young people I, I think so you know. too and i think well as as we've been doing it like and people get it when we explain it to them and it's like you can we talk afterwards and we're like you know and they're like yeah you're right like this yeah. is you know you, you don't think about it but yeah. then when you do it it is something you're missing so where did you did you grow up in brooklyn i grew up in long island city okay long island city you know, queens uh now a, you know astoria long island city very popular neighborhood now yes but when i was growing up uh, long island city where uh, was very industrial a lot of factories and a lot of the italians settled there because um, there was work in the factories. Right. There was, you know, a big uh, Lofts candy. They're out okay. of business now. There was a big uh, chocolate factory that they had Loft candy throughout the United States. And then they uh, there was uh, another factory, the Nobili Cigar Company. Okay. In Italian. But many people, when they came here, they had no skills. They didn't know English, the language. Right. So they worked, the in, they worked in these factories. And so there's a lot of factories and they settled in between the factories. And... Um, we were there and that's where we lived and grew up and now it's become a hot spot because you know now that a lot of big condos up there all yeah, along yeah. the waterfront is so popular even williamsburg i mean williamsburg, oh, williamsburg was, is yeah and then long island city the same thing you know, I, I look at the skyline now in brooklyn and and queens and i see countless skyscrapers and i said when I was a kid, none of them were there. No. There was no. nothing there. There was you nothing know? over we what? Saw like the five or six stories. Yeah, we saw the Pepsi Cola sign. We saw yeah, the smokestacks right. of Con Edison. And then you had Manhattan. And that was it. You had no skyline in Brooklyn. Or so Queens. what was the Pepsi Cola sign? Was that That's just there? I, no, I they, know, but the it, Pepsi Cola factory was it there. It was there. Right. And, and a they, lot of people worked there. Right. Oh, a lot of people. And then when they went out, they kept the sign. It was a landmark. Right, so of that course. Sign is back. But um it was um, um, very industrial. And now it's a hot spot. You know, have so many people. So there. you guys lived there like around the factories and, you know, would, um, uh, you know, what was it like? What kind of things did you do when you were a kid? Did uh, you play with kids? Yeah. Did you get yeah. into trouble? Did yeah, you we, ride we bikes played, around? Yeah, we played in the street. Yeah. We played in the street. We went outside and, you know, we looked forward to 
the church because the church was the center of the neighborhood. And when we were growing up, they didn't ask, you know, what neighborhood you came from. They said, where are you from? Oh, I'm from, from St. Rita's Parish. Uh, I'm from Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I'm from St. Patrick's. That's mm-hmm. how you explain where you lived. Right. Not your neighborhood. Now, you know, now they have all these names, you know, you, you know, their status symbols where you live. I'm in, you know, Jackson Heights. Now it's, you know, Jackson Heights East, you know, and stuff sure, like that. Sure, yeah, yeah, but yeah. all these things. But that's how it was then. Uh, and, um, you know, you went out and you played in the street. We played, you know, stick ball. We played football in between the traffic. You know, the cars would come in. We wait for them to pass. We played in the street. Uh, now you have to have all these signs and everything else and bike lanes and all. But then we, yeah, we went was, right in the street. You know, we fend for ourselves. And, uh, you know, and the church was the center of the neighborhood. And when you had a feast, every church had some type of bazaar or feast right. at the end of the year. Not as big as Our Lady Mount Carmel and stuff like that, but everyone, every parish had something as a fundraiser, but also it brought everyone together. Everyone would work, everyone would hang out there. And uh, that's what we did. Um, you know, I and I grew up there, and at the time in Astoria were a lot of Greeks. The mm-hmm. Greeks, uh, they settled in Astoria, and they say that there are more Greeks living in Astoria than in Athens, which is probably true because it's larger. <laughs> but uh, I'm growing up. So I'm a kid. I've been eating souffle and uh, gyro and all that stuff. Gyro, as they say. Yeah, I just actually <laughs> uh, opened a pizzeria for some Greek guys over there. I, yeah. I, I love the Greeks. I met the Greek. I met my first Greeks uh, when I I took off. It's a long story. We won't get into it. But somehow I landed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was <laughs> like, I think, 18 years old. And yeah. um I ran into these uh, this Greek family, the Takis family, and they had like a couple businesses on the south side, and they they were bridge painters. They had a cafe, they had a gyro shop, a few different things. But um, you know, like Greeks are uh, Greeks are very very proud of their heritage all, always, yeah. and and Greeks always got to tell you how whatever you're doing, whatever's going on. It's related back to Greece. And I remember Tony Take is going to me. He's like, oh, you're Italian. You know, Greeks and Italian, it's the yeah, same thing. We built the peninsula. Yeah. We got a lasagna here. You got a lasagna there. Right, right, and right. blah, 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 blah. But it was, um, no, it was hilarious. What, what? I mean, going back to like the, the on the street things. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, we, you know, we had like... 10, 20 guys that we'd roll around with on our bikes, you know, oh, and all yeah. the kids from the neighborhood. You don't, I don't, I never see kids on the street. Uh, uh, is you, there, see, you see adults on the street. Now. You see adults on the right, street right, all the, the time. Kids. You don't see children on the streets anymore. What happened to that? Because well, the, the, the parents got, you know, I mean, you know, safety, you, you hear stories of things that happen to kids. So right. You, they, these things happened before, but we didn't hear about them. Well, that's a, I was so, going to say, it, yeah. it was much worse right. in the 70s of with course. child abductions and, and different things going right. on. But, it, you know, we didn't hear about it. The press right. puts everything on the front page over and over again. They scare the, the people to death. Right. So the parents became, uh, we call them uh, helicopter parents. Yeah. They hover over their children and they won't allow them to do anything. I used to walk 10 blocks in the fourth grade. I was, uh, yeah. you know, 12 years old, We used to get on the subway old. when I was 10 years old. Yeah. We, we'd go on Nine with 10 years guys. Nine years old, and, walking, and, you know. Yeah. And now we, uh, they can't do anything. But, you know, when we were kids, uh, you know, we made our own fun. I mean, we never sure. went on vacation. We never did anything. We hung out in the street. That's yeah, and you had up. to be home for dinner. Your yeah. mother would call you. Yeah, and you talk about riding bikes. Um, um, when I was a kid in Long Island City, they had the bridge that goes over to Roosevelt Island. Right. Now, when I was a kid, that was called Welfare Island. Really? Yeah, Welfare Island. And Why before, is that? Well, it, uh, it, someone, uh, the name of the guy who, who bought the island was Welfare. That was not, not the That was his name. That was his name, Welfare. It wasn't that they put Welfare. People, oh, okay. there. people on Welfare. But For anyway, everybody that doesn't know, that's the uh, where uh, Billy Crystal lives in City Slickers. Right, okay. So he's be- it's between Manhattan and Queens. Yep. It's that little island. Now there's a tramway. When I was growing up, there was no tramway. Or, and there's a subway. There was no subway then. It was only a bridge from Long Island City which right. was right next to the church of St. Rita. Well, still, that's how you got to drive out. You, right. you have the to only do, way by car, right? The only but way at least by now car. people can get on the tram. Uh, no, the no, train. of course. And the trams, it's cool. It's oh, like yeah. going on like a little ride. I remember when they, so when I was a kid, that island, all it had was two hospitals, Goldwater okay. and uh, Cola Hospital. And they were regular they hospitals? Was, no, they were state hospitals. Mental institutions? One was like a mental institution and one was long-term. You know, okay. people that, you know, long-term care. long-term care and stuff like that. 
and the rest and there was a fire training uh, facility there okay and we were kids we used to ride our bikes over the the welfare island bridge and we used to ride around there were weeds over our heads really they were dirt roads wow and we would ride from one island to the one side of the island to the other and the fire department it's not like today everything is closed and locked they had an abandoned building with a trampoline and when they used to go out on a run they would we, they would go over the bridge into long island city and there was no one there watching the the, the site the, the right, facility. Right, 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 right. so we would get on our bikes we would climb up this six-story building and they had windows on each floor and we would go out we would start on the first floor jump out onto the trampoline and then to the second who was ever daring they were going to oh floor. so it was it was like a trampoline yes. for them training training to, yes to, for people to and jump we out would do that you would jump out yeah. of a building and then there was no that's one around fun. that's awesome and then then <laughs> when you saw the the fire engines coming back over the bridge you had then you had to run you had, you had 10 15 minutes because of right. over the bridge and so you saw them coming we got on our bikes and we ran yeah. and we rode away you had to get out of there right. though because they'd probably smack you around yeah, if they call course. you doing it they'd be like what are you doing yeah. and now and now there's all these high rises there it's amazing yeah you know yeah, to there's... say you know you're on that island when it was nothing weeds you know yeah. it's amazing i mean i remember when i was a kid and i uh you know i watched city slickers and the <laughs> opening scene is you know billy crystal coming over to roosevelt island on the tram and i'm looking at this thing and i'm like wait a minute that's in new york and i'm like ma we're, we're going to, we're going to taking that yeah. i've always had like a little bit of affinity yes. for roosevelt island so what about um you know i want to get back to the kids thing for a second have you noticed because you know obviously you're um you know you're involved with the school and everything have you noticed like uh like a change with you know maybe like from not being able to go out and socialize as much and this and that with oh. the kids are having a harder time oh i think there's no question i mean the uh the social skills of children is non-existent right their social skills because of the internet and social media they and not being able to go out with other kids they don't know how to communicate with other people and other kids they don't know how to socialize they don't know how to to relate right. that's the thing and uh it's sad it really is sad because they're missing out on a lot uh all that development that you know you can't get on the internet Right. It has to be that human factor, that human interaction. Yeah. And kids who are in a very, you know, young formative years um, are missing out on that. And sure. whatever they're getting on social media, everyone has an agenda and they're just pushing that on these kids and they, they don't know any better. And they're, you know, they're not all going in the right direction yeah they're susceptible to it okay. yeah i mean i think uh hopefully you know what i mean in the next years to come like the the new parents like kind of realize you know what i'm saying we got to get yeah. these kids out we gotta yeah the pendulum you know, has to come the, back yeah it, we it, we gone. own the streets so you yeah, know what i mean exactly. like you know yeah. um i mean even here where uh you know we're in bushwick right now and i didn't grow up in this neighborhood but i'm like a part of the family over here right. you know what i'm saying like i can let my kid run around yeah. and like it's not a problem yeah. um, and when we're kids you know you, you talk about now you know you talk about uh uh racial equality and all that stuff we didn't have any of that you know, right. we went to school. I mean, we played, you know, in Long Island City, we had African-Americans, we had Hispanics, we had Jewish kids. We all played. We went to school together. There was no separation. We that's, right. This is all we knew. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, it's like the politicians got involved in it. And now it's like it's being forced on people and they're, they're, they're separating people rather than bringing people together. Yeah. I no, hate to say it. That's you definitely know? no good. You know. Um, what about um uh i remember well so funny story that like you uh actually uh you know introduced me to so you know we did me and shaylin my wife who i'm sure most of the people listening to this know shaylin she's more popular than the yes. night and the pizza <laughs> world um you know By we way, got your, married your, your two portraits are still down there go oh, oh i gotta go i gotta go grab those um i wouldn't throw them away so uh so yeah, we did our we did our wedding this past year yes. um, at uh, Annunciation, which is right. one of the most beautiful churches in the world. And Gennaro Lombardi was actually married them, first pizza guy in America or first pizzeria in America. 
allegedly. Um, was married there. He was married at Annunciation, okay. and and supposedly Totono was as well. Oh, really? Um, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. um, that was like a little bit of uh, pizza history. I think Scott Wiener was the one that was oh, okay. uh, told us about that because we know some pizza historians. But um, my senior Jamie did an amazing job doing that out. And then, you know, I think it was you and Philly and you guys were asking me, you know, what are you doing, you know, for the food and everything like that? Because we rented out the uh, the gym right. in the hall. And, you know, we were like, you know, we're, we were going to do like a buffet with chicken parm and, you know, different things. But, um, you know, because of COVID, uh, we're going to do these. I got my chef friend and we're going to do these nice, uh, you know, prime rib sandwiches and chicken cutlet sandwiches. And we're going to wrap them in the, the black and white uh, checkered wax paper. Right. And and Monsignor looks at you, looked at me and you go, uh what you having a football wedding <laughs> right. and i go what's a football wedding i had no idea so right. if well, you want to when i was a kid i remember my parents saying that they had a football wedding right and i said what's a football wedding you know and they told me first of all they didn't have these big catering halls they couldn't palaces, afford it nothing yeah you got a local hall a knights of columbus hall or a you church, know, a a church BFW. Hall, BM, yeah exactly yeah. veterans hall and what you would do you invite people and they didn't have hot buffets. They had a football wedding. What they did was everyone in the family, uh, who, uh, the family of the immediate family, those getting married, they would make sandwiches mm -hmm. and they would wrap them up and they would label them. So when you went to the to the wedding, there would be a basket of sandwiches on each table. Right. And they would open them up and they would look at them and he said, oh, this is, you know, ham and cheese. This is roast beef. This is uh, mozzarella. This is uh, uh, mortadella. This is uh, supersad. So when they say, oh, I don't like them, what do you have? They said, oh, I have turkey and cheese. I have a mozzarella. Here, let's switch. So they throw them to one another. Right, like they a toss. football. And so they called it a football wedding. That's So that's... when you were saying, when I saw the sandwiches, it's yeah. just like a football wedding. And that's how you, you were Well, introduced. I ended up doing all this other <laughs> research. And they're like, you and Philly were looking at me like I'm nuts. They're like, wait a minute. <laughs> You you're doing this and you didn't yeah. even know what a football what it was. Yeah. I was like, bro, I don't, I have yeah. no idea. It's like full circle thing. But yeah. I went and did all this research on the football wedding thing, and it was like, I, I I asked people from the neighborhood. I tried to look it up on the internet, but it was um no, it was a beautiful thing. And like, thank you so much for making that all possible. That was yeah. like a, an amazing wedding. You had a great wedding. It was good. So now we get the feast coming up. Um. Where what we're going July seventh to July eighteenth, right? right? So that's what eleven days. Yeah, actually, it's twelve days. Uh, twelve days. Uh, the highlight is the opening night. We have a mass. We bring out the statue of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Saint Paulinus. That's July seventh. Seven. Okay. Then on the tenth, we have the Cuesta, where we go around with the food with the bread. The eleventh is Giglio Sunday, where we dance the Giglio in the boat. Uh, we have a night lift that was introduced about five, six years ago. Right. We do it at night, all lit up. It's beautiful. It's not as hot. And that's on Wednesday. Uh, that would be the uh, 14th. Uh, and then we have the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel on the 15th. And then the 16th. And then uh, that Sunday, which is the last Sunday, is Old Timers Day, where we invite all the old timers back. And... Um, that's the 12 days of the feast. And of course, every night we have food, we have music, we have games, we have uh, all these different things going on that really, you know, the whole family can come to. It's right. just a, a great time. Yeah. No, it's amazing. Um, uh, what, 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 uh, have you ever like, uh, I, I've always wondered this about like, uh, you know, because obviously the Vatican is, you know, this famous place. Have you ever been to like Rome? Did, oh, many is times. That, is many that something times. like if you're a priest, you go yeah, to Rome? Exactly. How does that work? Is it like uh, you, you pay up to the guy? Like, I'm, uh, no. I don't No, right? No, I mean, I, of course, Rome is open to everyone, the Vatican. And you know, okay. when you're in the priesthood, you get to know priests, you get to know different people. We have uh, some of our seminarians are studying there. So, you know, they get to know people in the Vatican. So when you go over, you get to, you know, the inside track. You know, you get to go inside the places that the public doesn't go to. Right. You know, people that work there. Uh, so, you know, there are different ways. But of, like as a Catholic, the, the, the Pope is like what? The Vicar of Christ, right? Right, right. So, so like how does, but then each diocese is independent? Of each other, or yeah. how does this work? Well, the Pope is the Pope is the head, obviously. Is the head of the right, the and then and, the right. spiritual head, right? Of He's the, the spiritual head, 
And then you have uh, the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. And the Cardinals um, are, they, they're in diocese, dioceses throughout the whole country. So and the world, right? And the world, and the world, and the world and Italy, and throughout the world. Yeah. But the cardinal is in charge of a, a territory, you know, geo geographical area. Okay. And then, then you have smaller dioceses around them, and they have bishops in them. Right. So you know, the the cardinals report directly to the pope. The bishops report to the cardinals, and that's how it works. Okay. And then the cardinals in each country report to a delegate, a representative from the pope the United States, like an ambassador. Every mm -hmm. country has an ambassador to a different country. The Pope has ambassadors to different countries throughout the world. So they're the liaison between the Pope and the bishops in, and the cardinals in that country. Okay. So that's how it works. And then when when you go to Rome, are you going there to like study stuff or what are you, what well, are you no, doing you over go there? For many things. You go to visit people there okay. that you know are working there. You go to pray to celebrate mass there. You go in, when... Uh, People are canonized, saints are canonized, and sometimes there's a certain meetings there that representatives go to, and you may be representing your diocese, and you go, and, and no matter how many times you go, you can't take it all in. I right. mean, I've been there over 25 times, and there are still things that I haven't seen, things you, you learn every time you go, so you never get bored of going to the Vatican. The, uh, it's the yeah. eternal city. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, Rome's, uh, uh, we actually, yesterday, we had Giulio Adriani. He's actually from Rome, uh, from Forcella. You know, Forcella, yeah. uh, the pizza restaurant yes. on Lorma Street? Yeah, yeah, Forcella. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Forcella, yeah. Uh, yeah, Forcella, it's next to, uh, uh, but yeah, so, so what are like, uh, what are some of the things that, you know what I'm saying? Like maybe you would like to tell like maybe younger people who aren't really involved in the church anymore. Maybe they came up in it, but you know. Like a lot of, a lot of people of uh, what do you call uh, lapsed? How do lapsed you, Catholics, right? Lapsed Catholics. People that have uh, moved away or moved away from the faith. You know, right. they, they were brought up. They were baptized. Right. They made their first holy communion. Maybe they went to Catholic school, but then after high school, you lose them. And right. a lot of times, you don't get them back until they get married. They all want to have a church wedding. They get married, and then you don't see them again until they have their babies and they want to have them baptized. Right. You know. So. Um, you know, we, we want to constantly stay in, in, in touch and connected with those lapsed Catholic, Catholics that have, you know, kind of drifted away from the church for whatever reason. Uh, you know, sometimes it has to do with uh, uh, marriage situations. They get divorced and the church doesn't recognize divorce. So they have issues with that. Sure. Uh, people that, you know, maybe their sexual orientation isn't in teaching with the church. So they feel alienated but that's not true i mean the, the church welcomes everyone and you know sometimes we we have to address certain issues that we have to try to deal with and work with together but that doesn't mean that you're not welcome in the church and right. you know the church just wants to make you know, try to, its best to keep your relationship with god open no matter what yeah i've definitely been running into more and more people over the past couple of years that like they they'll you know what I'm saying? They're having problems in some way and this and that. And I'm like, they're like, yo, oh, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, bro, maybe go to, go to the church. Exactly. You know what I mean? Why don't you, you know, go, you know what I mean? It's a positive thing. It's, right. um, you know, a community thing that like, I, I think, uh, I think there's like kind of a, maybe sometimes a misunderstanding of, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying? Like what it could actually be and what it could actually mean for people and how it right. could help people. Um, I, I think like sometimes people don't think about it like that, right. you know what I mean? And it's, I think it's hugely important. Um, well, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good over here. Um, okay. Monsignor, thank you so much for coming. Oh, and it was great. Yo, was great. everybody great make sure you make it to the olmc feast the feast of san polino it's going on this july 7th we're going to release this podcast early and uh we'll be over there lucy's will be there uh d best calzones will be there we'll the food have is uh, great. the food's great we're going to be doing fritterini and pizza portfolio and we'll see you guys over there thanks thank a lot you. Monsignor. you know, i thank really you. appreciate it's it great being here. all right man